Thank you very much, Dolan, for that introduction. Yes, so yes, I'm Gary Pollock from Manchester Metropolitan University, here to talk to you about the Growing Up in Digital Europe uh, survey. Um, as you can see, I've got the UCD badge on this uh, slide um, because actually I'm in a strange position whereby I'm presenting a project which is technically led by Dr. Jennifer Simons of the Geary Institute at UCD. But uh, the reason why that is will become apparent hopefully uh, as, the, uh, as the presentation continues. So yes, I've entitled this um, uh, Building the Largest Social Science Research Infrastructure in Europe. Um, I'll be saying a, a little bit about, um, about uh, research infrastructures I'll, and uh, I'll talk a bit about my background as well over the course of this um, presentation. But um, before I, I do that, of course, I was supposed to be in Dublin doing this presentation. So I thought I would start with a little photograph of Dublin uh, from some years ago, because um, I'd rather be there than sitting where I am at home uh, in Glossop between Manchester and Sheffield. So this is O'Connell Street uh, back in 1961. This photograph was actually taken by my father uh, when uh, him and uh, his, his wife-to-be that got married later that year uh, visited Dublin. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, well, it's, it looks a little bit different, I think, O'Connell Street now compared to what it looked back then. But uh, what I'm gonna do with this presentation is talk an, um, about an, um, under a number of headings. Um, and uh, the first one of which is, how did I get here? Um, so it, I'm going to say a little bit about my own background and try to explain how it is that I've got interested in comparative longitudinal surveys um, and, and ultimately been taking this project forwards. That will involve talking about research infrastructures. There'll be a timeline of the various projects which have led up to where we are now with GUIDE and then some more detail about the research uh, design that Guide has and about the consortium and how we're building it. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. So uh, you'll indulge me maybe for the first few slides where I talk about myself and my background. So as an early career researcher, I was very much interested in the transition from school to work um, and uh, particularly using survey evidence and longitudinal survey evidence. So I was quite an early user of, what, of, of the British household per panel survey, uh, which has sort of morphed into the Understanding Society uh, survey, which I'm sure many of you know. And so, so this is a, some early work I did back in the mid 90s, where I was looking at retrospective um, employment histories. In this case, that diagram is, is of, of female employment histories taken from the uh, British Household Panel Survey back in 1991. So you know, my interests are in, in longitudinality, in, in how things progress over time for, for individuals, um, and it always has been. However, um, uh, I then uh, became interested in international research, and um, I got involved in something known as the South Caucasus Life History Project. Um, and uh, this, was a, this was an interesting project which was funded out of the EU um, at, after the, uh, the, the, the breakdown of communism. And this particular project um, involved looking, uh, again, longitudinally using retrospective methods. Um, so sort of repeating the kind of methodology used in the British Household Panel Survey. And what we, did, what we were interested in was how people in the South Caucasus, um, they managed their transition during the time when communism was breaking down. So what we had was a sample of 30-year-olds um, um, around about uh, uh, um, 2005. So this project was sort of 2005 to 2009. And we were asking them retrospectively what their lives were like back from the age of 16 and onwards. So we were interested in leisure, employment, uh, education, um, and, um, uh, and family formation. So, so that, that, that got me interested in combining um, uh, longitudinal methods with comparative methods. The, uh, the, diag the, the map there shows you the different places that we did our study. So we did, it, we did it in two locations in Georgia, two in Armenia, and two in Azerbaijan. So that was uh, contrasting both within and between those countries. Then um, that I followed that um, project up with something known as the My Place project, which was not a longitudinal project, but nonetheless, it, it continued our, the, the comparative uh, methodology um, insofar as what we did was uh, 
uh, a 14 country survey looking at 30 different locations and we had a common questionnaire so that we could do comparative work where we were particularly interested in the um, social and political attitudes of, of young people aged 16 to 25. Um, and there we were interested in, uh, in particular, the way, the extent to which they were getting radicalized, um, the extent to which populist politics was on the rise, which of course it was, and the differences between the different regions of Europe. Because as you can see in the map, we uh, did, we worked in Russia, we worked in Georgia, we worked in Portugal, um, uh, Germany, Croatia, uh, Britain and so forth, you know, so it's uh, it's quite a large project and it was interesting also in so far as it was multi method so we didn't just do the survey. We also did ethnographies we did interviews um, we did case studies in museums and so forth as well. Moving on so we we were in in my research unit, which is known as Peru the policy evaluation and research unit um, we developed this capacity um, and the skills to do. Uh, longitudinal and uh, comparative work. And it just so happened that in 2014, they put out a call towards a European longitudinal childhood and youth survey. They were asking the question in the commission, is it a good idea? Is it desirable? Is it possible and feasible to do a longitudinal survey which has got a focus on uh, child well-being? So we looked at that. We thought, well, we've got the, the, the uh, skill to be able to answer that call. And, and we, we won it, and that project became um, the MyWeb project, and MyWeb standing for Measuring Youth Wellbeing. And so here um, you can see that, uh, so the, 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 the MyWeb project, it, it, um, it ended in 2016, and we did our final presentation in Brussels in, on the 27th of June uh, 2016, and that's a photograph of it there. Uh, and for those of you um, uh, who can remember your recent history, the Brexit referendum was held the week before uh, that, that particular meeting. So we arrived in Brussels on the 27th feeling quite deflated that uh, we'd just done this great project which had said, yes, the, this longitudinal survey is desirable. We've done all sorts of things with policymakers and scientists and practitioners to, to, to demonstrate that and that it's feasible. So, um, so we got to Brussels to present all this to, uh, um, to, to the bureaucrats there, um, but, but we were not feeling very positive about the fact that uh, Britain had uh, just decided to leave the EU. Now, at that meeting, a um, number of important pe people present. It was chaired by Margaret Tewitt. Some of you may know Margaret. She's from Ireland, uh, maybe even from Dublin. And she was chair of the Inter-Service Group um, for the Rights of Children. Uh, in the in the commission at that time, so she chaired the meeting, and um, well, she was she was a bit circumspect about what we were doing and wasn't entirely convinced that it was a good idea. But there was another chap at this um, meeting who you can just see there on the on the right hand side of the picture, is looking away from the camera with glasses on, and that chap uh, his name is Dominic Sobchak, and he took us to one side at the end of our uh, presentation, and he said to us, "I know what you should do next." Um, and he explained what we needed to do next. Uh, and he said that what we should be thinking about is developing a research infrastructure uh, and that we should be thinking big and we should be thinking to uh, uh, extend the reach of what we're doing and to actually create this survey. So not just that we've demonstrated that it's feasible and desirable, but we should actually try to bring it into being ourselves. Now, when we think about research infrastructures, when I used to think about research infrastructures first, I would think of big shiny machines, such as the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Big facilities, expensive technical equipment, which needs significant investment for uh, scientists across uh, the world to be able to have access to it. That's, that's generally what people think of in relation to research infrastructures. But it reminded me also of uh, a training course that I did back in the mid 90s when uh, there was something called the Panel Comparability Project, the PACO project, which was developed by a, um, a researcher called uh, Gaston Sharma based in, in, in Luxembourg. And so he, he did this training course. He was bringing together these household panel surveys across Europe and trying to find ways of, of uh, analyzing them comparatively. Um, and of course, there were enormous challenges in doing that. Um, you know, the, these surveys, they hold a different questionnaires. There was no, there was, there was no one had sat down and, and to ensure that there was the same thing uh, included in each of them. The different sampling methodologies. 
they were done at different times. They were done with different frequencies between the data collection waves. So this panel comparability project, to some extent, failed because what the idea was great. You know, we need to analyze comparatively uh, longitudinal data and, and uh, to get the most out of it. But it, it was exposing the shortcomings of the fact that all the, the, the research designs were so different. The harmonization was extremely difficult. Um, and so, you know, we've we, we, we done this. Uh, uh, We've done the MyWeb project uh, and um, come, it had come to an end. Dominic had said, we, I, I know what you need to, to do, you need to, to take it forward. What did we do? We, we applied for a further grant, for a, a grant under the uh, infrastructure development program of uh, uh, Horizon 2020. And, and that became the European cohort development project. So this was a design study um, where it gives you the space uh, to actually um, develop uh, the design of a research infrastructure. And so we had two purposes here. We wanted to do the scientific research design and we wanted to um, develop the business case, show how it could be funded, show what it, what it would cost. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so that project, which was a relatively short project because we were advised to, to make it, uh, to, to, to do it uh, relatively quickly, um, and the reason why we were advised to do it relatively quickly was in order for us to, to think about, again, how we could take it forward, because we didn't want to delay things uh, too much. Um, now, uh, during the project, the European Core Development Project, um, I was presenting uh, the, the uh, results of, of it uh, at one particular conference, which is uh, the Methods of Longitudinal Studies Conference, which was at the University of Essex, a conference which uh, it's, it's, it's got two um, uh, iterations. There was one previous one around 10 years ago, and then there was one in 2018, both organized by Peter Lynn from the University of Essex. And um, so I presented at, at that conference, and I met um, Dr. Jennifer Simons from uh, UCD, uh, who clearly only just managed to make it because uh, the, the, the Ryanair, play, uh, they were cancelling flights at that time, but she, I found this old tweet where she was uh, thanking Ryanair for having got to the conference okay. So I met uh, uh, Jennifer at this, at this conference and she was very interested in what we were doing in both MyWeb and the European Cohort Development Project. And that turned out to be a really fortuitous meeting uh, for me, uh, and hopefully for her as well. Um, because um, at the end of the project, uh, the end of the ECDP project, we held a launch. We held a, a launch. We decided we were confident enough that we could take things further, that what we would do is we would hold a launch event, which was held in 2019 in Brussels. Uh, and here I've got um, Dominic Sobchak, who is the, uh, the S3 Executive Secretary, who was at that meeting, uh, to do with the MyWeb um, project, uh, he was he did a presentation for us, um, and, he, and he was arguing that the, the, what we were doing was important, that it would take time to develop. Um, and of course, you can see there that, that the the name of the survey back in those days was "Growing Up in Europe." We didn't have the D, the digital bit in it. Uh, "Growing Up in Europe" um, seemed like a good acronym at the time, but it's not quite as good as as Guide. Um, and there there are reasons why we think that it's important to have digital within the name of the um, the, the study as well, because it's uh, because society is increasingly digital. It's not that the survey has a focus on digital. So we did our, our end of project um, event in Brussels. It was a launch event, and um, at that time, which is 2019 in in uh, November 2019. We were getting even closer to the Brexit agreement uh, coming into force. And so things were getting quite fraught and quite difficult because in relation to taking this project further, um, Britain was getting further and further away from the EU. And that was that was a, a problem. And we were told that it would be a, a fundamental problem. And that's where that's when we, we decided that what we needed to do was to give control of the project, uh, to share it with um, a reliable partner, and that partner turned out to be uh, Jennifer Simons uh, of, of UCD. So back to the fortuitous meeting that I'd had with her at the Moles conference. And so uh, since that time, since just uh, just after this launch event, which, which Jennifer and a number of uh, representatives from the Irish uh, government, I think, were there as well, just after that time, we've been working together on 
furthering um, what is now GUIDE. And that, that uh, in particular has involved us looking at what's known as the ESRI roadmap. So there is this um, uh, acronym ESRI, European Strategy Forum for Research Infrastructures which is a European um, office which, uh, which is uh, focused on facilitating different research infrastructures in all scientific disciplines across Europe. And for the social sciences, this, um, uh, this, this means in terms of surveys, in terms of social science surveys, four particular surveys. Uh, there's the SHARE survey, which was uh, one of the earliest uh, research infrastructures, the survey of health, ageing, retirement in Europe. And I know that at one point, the Tilda study, what is now the Tilda study, which was, I believe, originally based at UCD, um, was part of SHARE and then peeled off from it. Then there's the European Social Survey, which I believe is based at uh, UCD. So you know all about research infrastructures, so I shouldn't really need to say anything to you about them. But they're established research infrastructures. They've been around for some time. And, and every now and then, the S3 um, office, it, it refreshes what's known as the roadmap, and um, it's lo looking on the lookout for new projects which should be included, which get, should, should get support to try to facilitate them coming into being. And in the, 20, uh, in the recent 2021 iteration of the roadmap, um, two surveys were included, the Generations and Gender Programme, um, which is in the bottom right there, but of course the guide project as well was included. So now we are a recognized project on the S3 roadmap. And as you can see there, it's led by Jennifer Simons as well as myself. So we're on the roadmap. Um, what is this, this roadmap? Well, the S3 uh, roadmap is um, it's a process um, which is, uh, is quite well established now. Um, as uh, the S3 people, they, they, they have a very clear idea of the life cycle of research infrastructures, um, taking them through from, from concept development through to termination. So this idea is, the idea is that all research infrastructures should go through this particular set of stages. And for us, our concept development was the MyWeb project. The design part was the uh, ECDP project. We are currently in the preparation phase, um, so we do we are working on a project at the moment, which I'll tell you about shortly. But we're also going to have an um, important application in for a further preparatory grant. Um, so, so we're at that pre the preparation phase now. We're, we will be eventually moving towards implementation, and that implementation will mean that we're actually out there collecting data in the field, collecting the data. Um, and then operation and termination. So, that, so we do have to have a, a finite, a, an idea of what the finite, uh, uh, what the end of the, of the project is going to be and how it needs to, to be rounded off. Okay, so I've pretty much gone through most of this with the, the, the slides I've, I've uh, talked about already. So we've got the MyWeb project, which is the first one, and then the ECDP. ECDP where we then start to call it our project Euro cohort. But that we, we're working on another project at the moment. We've got what's called um, a starting community grant called Coordinate, and I've got a few slides about that. Uh, that's a four year project, 21 to 25. We're looking to get a preparation phase grant, um, which would be led by Jennifer, and that will be um, 2022 to 26. We're trying to get uh, ERIC status, that's European uh, Research Infrastructure Consortium, it's a legal, uh, a legal entity. Um, and then we're looking to uh, get to implementation operation and ultimately termination, which would take the project up to 2053. So we really are, this is big, this is why it's so big, because you know, this is why it's a research infrastructure, because what we're doing here is way in the future, it involves lots of countries, and you know, when you actually add up all of the, the, the money that's required for it, it's an enormous amount of money. And you know, we're talking you know, something which is not, not far short of a, uh, a billion euros, where all EU countries or, or European countries to be included. But the question maybe should still be asked, why do we need guide? You know, there are lots of surveys already out there on children and young people across Europe, across the world, and there's just a few of them listed here. Uh, and all of these studies are great. They've been demonstrated to be really useful and important uh, in terms of um, uh, scientific um, understandings, as well as uh, helping policymakers develop policies. 
uh, in, in the different uh, jurisdictions where, where they're based. But so, so, so why, why do we need guide? Well, the answer to that is, of course, in terms of the, the desire for comparative research. Um, you know, most people, uh, most scientists are interested not just in what happens in, your, uh, in, in one particular uh, location, but how that compares with what's happening elsewhere. And because of the problems which the PACO study exposed, um, you know, the fact that if you've got if you've got surveys which are not designed with harmonization and purpose that without the, it's very difficult to compare them, you're always doing post hoc harmonization. And so the more the, the greater the post hoc harmonization you have to do, the less comparative your um, your study is, your, the studies are. Um, and so our idea with guide is that uh, we have full input harmonization. We start with uh, a common questionnaire and we, we translate that into the different uh, languages. We start with a, a, a common approach to sampling, to field work and, uh, in, and to data storage and access. So we have comparability uh, at the front of our minds from the outset, and therefore uh, it, 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 the extent to which there are post hoc harmonization problems, that should really ideally be reduced uh, as far as is possible. So what is the design then uh, for GUIDE? Um, so well, what we're doing with GUIDE is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something which we've got at the front of our minds with the scientists, we're leading it, um, but the call came from the European Union. And so we're very keen to, uh, to ensure that the guide study is going to produce policy relevant uh, data. It's, it's policy led, that's what we say. It, the, the, the major purpose for this survey and study is to aid policymakers and to aid understandings which will have a di direct practical uh, application in the policy environment. But also, we're very keen to be including children as uh, as much as we possibly can in uh, in the design process. So right back from the MyWeb days, we had ch uh, children's advisory boards. We did all sorts of work with them um, to try to talk to them about how we should be doing things. Um, and uh, of course, we don't talk to them about sampling and things like that, but we're talking to them about the kind of methods that we should be using, the kind of questions we can be asking. Uh, so going much farther than just cognitive testing, actually trying to involve them in, in, in further aspects of, uh, of the research pro process. So we are uh, a truly child uh, centric, I think, as a, a, a project. So it's important to us to be including children. So we've got we've we're, we've got children's advisory boards in in different countries at the moment in the work that we're doing. What's distinctive about the methodology? Well, uh, as I've already said, the question is content. The content is policy focused. It's input harmonized. Children, young people are involved. It's an accelerated design. So I've got a diagram of, about this shortly. But what we're our idea is to um, to uh, pursue two parallel cohorts one which is eight-year-old children and uh, a subsequent one which would be nine-month-old uh, children and their main carer. Um, the idea is that the, the samples should be representative at a national level and that the data would be open access. So this is what's distinctive about GUIDE uh, compared to other, other projects. Okay, so in relation to what we would be planning to do, um, this is the, the fieldwork plan. Um, and as you can see along the bottom, we've got year, but up the side, we've got age of the child respondent. And um, so we've got the coordinate project 21 to 25, where this is it's a preparatory phase project. Um, we're looking to get into the field for the first wave of data collection for the eight year old cohort in 2027. And then for that cohort, we would um, follow them every three years up until the age of 24. And then in 2029, we would start a nine month old cohort, following them up uh, in 2031, and then subsequently every three years up until they were 24 years old. And so this is where we get the, um, the idea that the data collection uh, ends um, around about 2053. And you can see also from this, uh, this uh, diagram that, that at age eight, nine, for the second cohort, we would have comparable data. So it's not just that we're gathering data early on the eight-year-olds um, 
and being able to follow them through, but we'll be able to do comparative work um, with, the, with the second cohort as they, uh, as they get older, and that that age, com that age comparison exists um, throughout the life of the study. Now, we, we explored all sorts of um, different designs during the MyWeb project, and we arrived at this one because uh, we felt that it was useful to start with an eight-year-old cohort um, and, uh, and to get policy-relevant data out relatively quickly. Um, and that uh, that the that, that, uh, that then subsequently start with start a, a birth cohort or a nine month old cohort um, to give information at that that particularly important part of a child's life. Um, questions were raised about the extent to which we should be doing a pregnancy cohort. Uh, also, questions about whether we should be doing work every uh, data collection waves every two years. Uh, you know, the, all, all sorts of different designs were explored, but at the end of the MyWeb project, there was a process that we undertook to establish that this was a, a, a feasible um, and scientifically and, and policy focused productive um, methodology to take forward. Okay, so yes, yeah, so we've got um, we've got we developed questionnaires within within uh, the ECDP project, uh, one for eight year old children, one for um, the their the parent uh, and and then one for the parent guardian of a newborn to, uh, age up to nine month old. So we, we've got these three instruments which are developed in ECDP, ECDP which we are um, have refined quite significantly since then. The kind of approach that we've taken because um, we've got to differentiate ourselves from health based studies. You know, we're a, a social science study. We're interested in uh, a, a swathe of issues to do with with development um, an individual a child's development um, uh, in, in relation to psychology, education um, and, and various other social science uh, issues. And they're captured on on this slide here, which shows you the kind of um, topics that we explore in the questionnaires that we're developing. So health is there, um, but it's not, the, it's not the prime focus. Uh, we know that there are other cohort studies out there that have, have got much greater health focus. And it's often one of the questions that we're asked is, um, you know, just how much health information is going to be in there because, you know, things to do with the environment and, and so forth. So we're, um, we're mainly a social science survey, but with, with a focus on child well-being um, and, and some health indicators. We have done the yeah, we've created our, our wave one um, instruments and we've got an idea of uh, what we will collect in the, the subsequent waves to some extent that's all up for grabs but uh, this um, slide here captures uh, at the very least it captures the, the the data collection schedule and it tries to show how one particular theme to do with education uh, could very well be uh, shaped in the different uh, in the different waves of data collection so you can see there, you know, that uh, what we've got is that the, the child's age, the different cohorts, cohort one, cohort two, and then the extent to which in the, for the for the um, uh, for cohort uh, for the first, sorry, for cohort two, the nine month olds, it's only the parents that would be surveyed up and for the first three waves, and then it would be the child and the, and, and, and the parent. Um, uh, and, and for um, for the uh, first cohort it's which would be kicking it the, the eight-year-olds it starts with both child and parent and then by the time that child gets to age 17 then it's only them that's getting uh, surveyed we don't no longer would be asking the parent so that's the the basic uh, field work uh, design okay so something about sampling then um so the uh the idea is that we would be sampling over a full year, so capturing uh, a calendar year here, whereby um, people born from the uh, from January to December. I think we actually are suggesting that it would be um, um, September to uh, August. Um, so, so the children are sampled within each of those months, so that we, because we know, of course, that month of birth is an, often an important factor when it comes to certain cognitive and educational uh, outcomes. Uh, the sample design accepts that there will be uh, variations between different countries because of the availability of uh, data in different uh, countries. 
However, there would be a, a commonly prescribed level of statistical precision. So, so the idea is that we're collecting what you can do statistically with the, the data should it should be possible to do comparative work uh, with it, irrespective of which countries you're including in your analysis. And that we will have um, we'll have a sampling team which will be uh, looking at this in the same way that these other this, the share survey and the ESS survey have sampling teams to uh, ensure that there is a uh, full comparability um, of, uh, of, uh, of of each of the surveys. Uh, if I could just come in there for a moment, we, we have a question from Carmel Hannan. Um, who asks, uh, given that getting access to representative and random samples is getting harder and more expensive, how does GUIDE plan to ensure large sample sizes? Are you using incentives? Are you using agencies to collect the data? What is the minimum sample size per country? Um, and Carmel uh, concludes by saying it's sounding very like the Growing Up in Ireland survey or the Millennium Cohort Studies. Okay, thank you for the question. And yes, um, uh, let, let me just answer them briefly now, and then some of it gets to develop later. So incentives, incentives are, uh, are perfectly acceptable for us. And, you know, we know that there are some countries where you cannot have incentives. Um, uh, I believe Finland, in, in Finland, you're not allowed incentives, but in, in where, where a country can have incentives, that's absolutely fine within our methodology. In terms of agencies, uh, the, the, the idea that we've got is, well, for, firstly, um, again, the what happens in each country is not going to be identical. So there wouldn't be a single agency collecting all this data uh, within all countries, as happens, for example, with the um, what's it called, the uh, European Quality of Life Survey. Um, it wouldn't be like that, it, but it would be in all likelihood put out to tender, and then agencies such as Kantar, Ipsos. Um, not saying in the UK, and I don't know what, what to, it would be in Ireland, would be able to tender to, to get the contract to do it. Um, I've got a slide about sample size in a moment, but yeah, these are all great questions. And actually, and, and, and so in, in a sense, what we're doing is we're trying to do the sort of Millennium Cohort Survey or uh, growing up in Ireland, but on an international level, we are looking to do something which is as big as each of those, uh, maybe, or maybe not entirely the, the same size, but as similar sort of size, uh, because of the idea is that the, the samples should be nationally representative. You should, and you should be able to break them down as much as you want to for certain sorts of analysis. So the, the big debate in, in the UK, for example, is, you know, that would it be a UK national survey or would it be uh, a, a survey which would have adequate representation in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and, uh, and England, uh, which would then, it would increase the, the, the sample size compared to what it would be for a, a, just a national UK one. Now, it's, it's a great question. Let me just skip to the next slide because the, 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 other, the other question you raised was to do with sample size. Um, and so the sample size is Peter Lim, who, who we, we uh, have, have on our consortium, who is our sample um, expert. And he's he was uh, responsible for determining what the appropriate sizes are. Um, and, and so what and, and the main drivers of sample size are uh, response rates and attrition rates. Um, so, you know, what, what are the known levels of attrition rates across Europe and how can we how can we manage those um, within uh, with, within our study? And it's given that we project that we are going to be ex we're going to do a study which is going to take these uh, children from birth up until the age of uh, 24. So. Um, so given that that's the it needs to be representative up until that age of 24 then what we what we arrive at is a sample size of around 10,000 for the birth cohort it can be slightly smaller for the child cohort at 8,000 um, because the, the the time window for attrition is shorter for them um, but that's for the, the, the for the for the larger european countries um, that's what the sample size, projected sample size would be. Um, but where there are, but of course, some for some countries in Europe, uh, including Ireland, um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's possible that, uh, that, that that would simply not be achievable. You know, the birth rate would, would mean, would make it a challenge, maybe impossible to, to have a, a sample size 
so uh, which is as large as that. So we have a waiver for small countries um, whereby it would be 5,000 for the birth cohort and 4,000 for the child cohort. In fact, it, it, could, it could even vary more if, because we do want to include countries such as Malta, Cyprus, you know, and be properly EU representative. So the, 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 main, the main issue for us is that it's got to be sufficiently large to withstand attrition over a 25 year period. And by the end of that period, it can still um, withstand inferential statistical analysis. Hope I've answered the question, but do come back to me at the end if not. Um, so where are we now? Uh, so we, as I've said a few times, we are in the midst of a project called Coordinate. So um, we can think about you know, Guide as being uh, an overarching umbrella, which has got, which has benefited from a number of projects and which hopefully will benefit from further ones. And so the one we're working on at the moment called Coordinate, it's got an acronym, um, which you can't quite remember, but it's a bit of a mouthful. But um, uh, what we're doing in the, in the Coordinate um, project is we're working with a number, of, um, a number of partners. And interesting, linking it back to the question which was just raised, if you look at this list, within our partner list, we've got um, Ipsos and we've got Kantar. Uh, Cantar Public. So we are actually working with the, the data collection agencies to try to scope with them, you know, how this is, is going to work uh, in, in, for us, you know, what the issues, what the pressure points are in relation to uh, the, the, the comparative dimensions here and the, ability, the, the requirements that we have for data collection agencies to be involved. But yeah, you can see who we're working with across Europe. It's a project which uh, which me and uh, Jennifer co-lead. Um, we're it's we started it a year ago, just over a year ago, April first last year. Uh, we're a year in. It's a four-year project, um, and within it, what we're we doing? Well, it's this is a, this is our web page as currently exists. It's got three. Uh, wait, what's well, got three um, uh, circles there? Initiating a community of researchers. Um, working to enhance child well-being, um, facilitating improved access to longitudinal survey data, and giving children a voice. That, that's sort of what we're doing. In, in, in actual terms, what we're doing is, is these three. It's access, networking, and joint research. So the access to existing data is it's, uh, it's where the recognition that there are a lot of uh, surveys which can support child, uh, the child well-being uh, policy making in existence, is there is, is is there sufficient capacity around Europe? Can we facilitate more capacity there and more knowledge about these different surveys? Um, and so that's where uh, we did. Uh, th there's a number of um, surveys around Europe, including uh, some which are based at uh, in Ireland and. Um, uh, and, and so we, we've got travel grants, mobility grants for researchers across Europe to be able to spend time in locations where such surveys exist um, to increase capacity. We're facilitating networking. So we've got, we're doing a lot of work to trying to extend our network. And I'll say a little bit more about that further in the further slides. Um, but, you know, we've got a fairly good network at the moment, but what we need to do is we need to build it outwards. And we need to, within our existing network contacts, um, make sure that we've got the right people on board, the people who've actually not just the, the, the scientists able to do this work, but the people who are able to make connections with policymakers and national funders, because an important aspect of research infrastructural funding is that you can get only so much from the commission. They will give you um, money to kickstart things, but when it comes to the kind of funding you need for data collection, that's got to come from national sources. So generally speaking, we're thinking about national funding councils uh, uh, or government ministries, and the, the networking that we're doing within Coordinate is, is, uh, is helping us uh, along that path. The final thing which we're doing in, in Coordinate is uh, some research. And that's where what we're doing is we are doing pilot studies for the instruments that we developed in the ECDB project. So those questionnaires, which I talked about earlier, um, we've been, uh, over the past year, we've been uh, refining them, uh, reducing the size of them, they're always too large to begin with, and doing some cognitive tests on them. Uh, and now we are at a stage whereby we are we're getting ready to develop the, the CAPI system. Um, and uh, 
because we'll, in, in January 2023, we will actually be going into the field to do quite significant piloting in Croatia, Finland, France and Ireland. So uh, each of those questionnaires, there'll be 250 responses uh, for, for them, for each of them. So it's quite a significant project, this, which, as you can see, it helps us along the way in relation to the kind of preparation you need to, to do to be able to, to to build outwards and you know also by, by doing by doing this work we we fully expect that others will be wanting then to come to join and we're already finding that that uh, that a number of uh, people around europe scientists around europe find out about us they want to talk to us about how how they can actually join uh, joined the um, the consortium. So he, so just to, to finish off, then I've got a few slides just to talk about the the uh, the consortium, the guide consortium. So as it exists at the moment, we've got uh, representation in twenty two, sorry, in eighteen countries. We've got twenty two partners in eighteen countries, and they're shown in green here. Um, and you can see that uh, you know that the the, the, the fairly good representation in, in important countries, but there are also significant gaps as well. Uh, and what we're looking to do at the moment is to try to plug these these uh, these gaps. Um, so we're working, you know, we, we've done, we've held meetings with a number of uh, scientists um, in Germany, uh, in Poland, in, in, uh, in Czechia, uh, Netherlands, um, and we, we, because what our aspiration, as I said, is to to cover as much of Europe as we can. So so that's the the, the, the consortium as is. It, it will get bigger. Um, the these are, there are memorandums of understanding in place with all of these partners. In fact, the, the memorandum of understanding is with UCD, of course, because you are the UCD is the is the lead institution within the uh, within the ESPRI process. What we've done uh, with the design of the, the guide uh, project is that we've uh, we've set it up in such a way that we're trying to facilitate late joining. You know, we've got our existing partners, um, but we want to be able to facilitate people joining at later stages. So our data collection begins in 2027, which gives us I mean, we, gives us time to try to encourage further. Um, further uh, countries to, to join in because of course they will need to be spending time to convince their government ministries or national funding councils that it's a, it's a good idea because as well as the S free roadmap system of course there are national roadmaps national research infrastructure roadmaps and so we're trying to see if we can get onto these national roadmaps as well as as a way of trying to leverage the funding getting onto the s3 roadmap the european s3 roadmap is really important in relation to that so we've got a bit of time um the 2027 first wave um it, it, you know we would we're hoping it's going to involve around about 10 countries uh, around europe we you know we've already got funding in place in some of those um but you know we're, we would also be setting things up in such a way that we would facilitate retrospective joiners um, so that they could come in in the second wave in 2030 and likewise with the second cohort which starts in 2029 you can see that you know we're talking quite some time in the future here but we, we're in recognition that uh, there is preparatory time needed in order to to get funding from these different bodies so um so there we are. So that's that's the, the design uh, as it is um, and, and, the, and, the, and the way that we've set it up to try to facilitate uh, late joiners. We are um, we are in this prepar preparatory phase. What are we doing with it? Um, well, it's we're doing a number of things. You know, the, the coordinate project is helping with one side of it, but we have also got a, a, a grant application in which Jennifer has uh, submitted. Um, it's a UCD led uh, um, application and that will um, give us further funding to, um, to take the preparatory stage further. Now we've got it's not just any old proposal you see it's a, it's a, it's a proposal to a proposal to a program a funding program which is only open to uh, projects which are on the S3 roadmap. So it's not open, an open access program at all. So the chances of success are, are high and we're hoping to hear about it over the coming months. So what would we do with that uh, preparatory phase uh, grant? Well, it's about building the infrastructure because of course what we need is, it's not just, um, it's not just good scientific ideas. We've got to think about it as a, an organizational entity. 
Um, we've got to think about you know HR policies and so forth. We've got to think about the uh, IT infrastructure, the way in which the the governance is set up. Uh, so so we're thinking about all of these different things that, that need to get done. Um, extending the network, to, trying to get the political support that we need across Europe um, to, uh, to, to, to raise the funding uh, that's needed. Uh, and that will be a four year project, which will take us up to 2026, um, uh, by which time you know, we would expect to be in a position to put around about 10 countries into the field with that first cohort. And so, so here we are. So it's it's been a long, um, a long road for me. You know, it's a, it's a fairly drawn out traje trajectory. People people talk about you know the the extent to which um, you know landing someone on the moon it took eight years, and we've been at it for like longer than eight years, and we're not not in the field yet. Um, but uh, you know, it, this is actually quite complex because it's not just about one study or one survey in, in one country. We, you know, our ambition is to do something much more complex. It's bound to take a lot longer. And because of funding cycles being different in different countries and you know, the political cycle as well, lining things up is a real challenge. And that's why we've got to take things one step at a time. So we, we, you know, we're doing quite well. We, we, we've, we've built this profile. Um, uh, it's it's getting known about um, across the world, um, and uh, we're, we're confident that we will be in a position in 2027 to actually go into the field. Um, I should say, you know, I just want to reflect back on um, that meeting uh, that I had with with uh, uh, Jennifer in Essex back in 2018, because you know, had had Ryanair cancelled their flights and she didn't and she hadn't got to the meeting, there's every chance that we would have not managed to put in an application to the S3 roadmap and therefore the project would have ended. So I really am very thankful that for the, the, the association that I've now got with Jennifer. It's, um, she's she's a, a great person to work with, benefiting, benefiting from it enormously. And I actually feel that the, the, the project has got a lot stronger now that it's co-led as well. It's really great to be working with a, a team at UCD on the coordinate project, but also in guide. Um, and, and I really do look forward at some point to be coming to Dublin to meet everyone in person. We had a meeting planned back in 2020. The hotels were booked, the plane were booked, but then of course, for obvious reasons, everything got cancelled. So I've been trying to get to Dublin for over two years now. Uh, I, I am hoping to get there actually in a couple of weeks to see uh, the, the colleagues uh, that on, on the coordinate project who will be um, finalising the, the CAPI system uh, in, in Dublin over the Easter weekend. Okay. Thank you very much. Um